Our study in the Epistle of 1 John will take us this morning into a broad study of light. Light. I want us to turn to, first of all, to the uh, sermon text, 1 John 1, verse 5. 1 John 1, verse 5. In fact, I'm going to start at verse 1, which we read last week. Last week we, we studied verses 1 to 4. Here we go. 1 John 1, beginning at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, John writes, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, that we have seen it and testified to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things, John says, to, so that our joy may be complete. Having said that, John says this, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That theme permeates the gospel and it is one of John's particular favorites. And as I was studying this week, uh, I decided to do a little word study on the noun light. And you know where it took me first? Genesis 1. Let's turn there. Verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said... Let there be light. And there was light. Yet, in verse 14, later, on the fourth day of creation, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule by the day, and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And that's a mystery. There was light. When God spoke creation into being on the first day. Yet, not until the fourth day did God create the source of light as we know the sun and the moon and the stars. You look that up if you like, but the light that was available on the first day was the Shekinah glory of God, God's light shining upon the earth. That's the light we still bask in. But once again, I say light and darkness permeate the story of now let's skip over to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 22. Revelation 22. I'll begin at verse 1. Then the angel showed me, John writes, the river of water, the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. And also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. Not just in season, each month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any accursed, anything accursed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night, verse 5, will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So the sun and the moon and the stars disappear in the time. We live in the meantime, the time between. We live under the blaze of the
the sun in the summer days, and we live under the warmth of the moonlight. All year long, we live under the twinkling of the stars. And we live in the church under the light of the gospel. And in the light, God gives each of us to bear. How are we shining? How did you shine this week, folks? How did your light shine this week during your worst day? During that loudest argument? During that moment when your kids were driving you completely crazy, was your light shining? We are, I think I am, the better at dimming my light or putting my light in you know, under the old bushel than uh, I am at letting it shine in the tough times. Well, this morning, John, who seems to be obsessed with light, will talk about light in our sermon text. Let me give you a little run through of our sermon notes here. Hebrew, the word light is or in Hebrew. And, 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 and it means, essentially, the character of brightness. Or is the character of brightness. In the New Testament, when light is used by Jesus, and by John, even by Paul, particularly, light, phos, phosphorus, phosphorescent, of course, is where it comes from, the manifestation of God's self-existent life and God's divine illumination to reveal and impart light to Jesus Christ. Now, this reminds me, of course, of the Transfiguration. Jesus was transfigured into a being of light. It was so bright the disciples fell on their faces. They didn't know what to make it. Little glimpse of what Jesus was going to give to the church. Let your light so shine, we will say again and again. Let your light so shine that people will see God. People will see me, not just you. So here's a quick run through, a brief run through of light in the scripture from Genesis. You should read these this week. There's your homework. These several texts here, so read those this week. Genesis 1 3, we are told that God, of course, is the creator of light. Genesis of Psalm 104, 1 and 2, God is clothed in light. Psalm 36, 7 through 9, God is the divine giver of life. And as I, Isaiah 60, which was read this morning, a great darkness will in times to come cover the earth. But the prophet says that darkness will ultimately be overcome by the light of God's glory shining through the Messiah he promises to send. That was Isaiah's message. A light will come that overcomes this darkness. Jump into the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Isaiah's prophecy is affirmed by old Simeon when he's holding the baby Jesus in his arms and said, Now I see the light of John chapter 1, John testifies that Jesus Christ embodied both the Word, the Logos, the everything of God, and the light, the phos, the true light of God, which gives light to every man coming into the world. John 12, Jesus teaches plainly that He was the light that is the glory of God. And in Ephesians 5, the Apostle Paul writes that believers, we aren't just called into we don't only abide in God's light. We don't just allow God's light to shine through us. According to Paul, believers filled with the Holy Spirit are the light. A transaction has occurred. And when Jesus left, he didn't take the light with him. He left it here, abiding in his truth. Let your light so shine. Since believers are filled with God's light, they, we, Paul says, we must live as children of light. Here's my contention, and I'm, I'm better at preaching this than living it, let me tell you. As creatures of light, as light bearers, divine light bearers, when we are involved in a struggle in the office, job site in our home. What is to shine forth most clearly is not the volume of our passion, but the light. It should bring light to every crisis. Bring light to every discipline. And this is given to us freely. We, for reasons God only can explain, 
are given the authority to turn our light on and off, to dim it, to put it under a bushel. But we have the power within us, the Holy Spirit, to let the light of God, the love of Jesus, shine through us in our worst moments. I have one more reading. I didn't add it here, but I added it this week as I read it. This is from Romans chapter 13. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep, Paul writes to Romans, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So then, the apostle reasons, let us cast off the works of darkness, let us put on the armor of light. And on that note, let us pray for Jesus. Lord, as we open your word, your holy word, and open our hearts to receive what you would show us this morning, Father. Teach us. Speak to us, Lord. Open up our minds and our hearts that we might receive the truth that you wish to convey to us. Each one of us this morning needs to hear a specific word from you, Father. I pray for that. Reveal yourself in your word to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before I read this morning's text, I'm going to note here, our study of this little epistle began last week with two bold declarations set forth by the Apostle John, a very old man by the time he wrote this letter. These things must characterize everyone who claims to be a Christian. If you, if your testimony is, yes, I'm a born again believer, I'm a Christian. I came to God through Jesus Christ on a certain date at a certain time, and I am now full of the Holy Spirit. Those things are part of your testimony. You should be characterized by three unambiguous characteristics. Number one, you should have an orthodox belief in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means what the Bible says about Jesus, I believe. That's all it means. It doesn't mean any extra biblical fact, any historical trend or suggestion. It is, I believe, what the Bible says. Two, genuine fellowship in community. Oh, ouch, that gets a little close to home. I like to think that you folks, that your hearts are knit together in love. But I know you've been through some wars. All churches, I certainly have been through some. Church, you know, I've said this a thousand times. Satan has only one tool to work against the church. He cannot unsave anyone. He can cause a little disagreement to blossom into a major issue. He can cause feelings to be hurt, people to leave the church and never come back again. He can cause such pain that people are careful to say certain things around certain people. The whole church fellowship is broken apart. That's all Satan can do. And we are so susceptible to it. But one of the signs of being a light bearer is participating in fellowship in community. And that is my prayer for this congregation. Is that not just you folks, but anyone else who joins us in the days and weeks and months to come will be embraced in fellowship. Because that's what we're supposed to do as light bearers. It's not an option. That's what we're supposed to do and experience. And finally, the third characteristic, a persistent and passionate and observable success in obeying the commands of Christ. I obey what Jesus said I should do. I obey and not doing what Jesus says I shouldn't do. And that's his whole world. Because we are humans. And we have strong emotions. We have strong opinions. We are apt to disagree readily. But we are the son of the light of God. And we are to obey our Lord and Creator. So, what do I mean when I say observable success? I mean, you should get along. I mean, you should be the shining light in the office when an argument breaks out. You should be the peace giver in your family when two people, two of your kids or your spouse and your kids are at odds. You are to be the peace, the light giver. Yeah, and that success should be seen. Oh yeah, whenever there's a problem, Call this guy, he can always calm temperatures down. He can always 
get people to talk. And every church needs folks just like that. You probably know some by name. I don't yet, but I'm sure I'll find that. The man or the woman who is a peace bringer and a peace giver. It's a great gift. And it's an important component of the church fellowship. Now, after that comes John's distillation of the message that he, along with his fellow eyewitnesses to the incarnate Christ, the disciples, received from Jesus that aforementioned message about light and darkness. Jesus talked about it all the time. I've got two readings here from eminent Bible scholars. Of all the statements about the essential being of God, none is more important, writes John Stott, than God is light. It is his nature to reveal himself as it is, as, as it is the nature of light to shine. And Marianne Mia Thompson writes, in many ways, the statement that God is light is the thesis of the epistle of 1 John. It's the theme of the whole letter. It includes a definition of God's character as well as profound implications for the life of Christian discipleship. In fact, to lay bare the relationship between the character of God as light and the Christian life as walking in light is the whole point of the first part of this epistle. Connection between John, between God as light and our responsibility to walk in the light is the subject of today's sermon. Let me read. Let's all turn to our Bibles in 1 John 1 and read today's text passage. I'm counting on you, God, to uh, hide me. 1 John 1. Beginning at verse 5, I'll read through chapter 2, verse 2. This is the word of the Lord. This is the message we have heard from him, from Jesus, John writes, and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, with God, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we Walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, My little children, John writes, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But, get to that in but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. gets right down to it in verse 6. Since darkness can have nothing to do with the holy character of God, any Christian whose life is more characterized by darkness than it is by light, and who claims to have fellowship with God, John says, is a liar. Can't be done. You know the When you're receiving the Word of God, is so clouded by the baggage you walk in the sanctuary with. If you are at odds with someone, if you are either living in a state of unforgiveness or have decided not to forgive someone with whom you are at odds, you cannot receive the like it's clean here. It kind of bounces off your thick old heart. God has made that possible. His word is powerful. And it is the truth. But he allows us, in our human weaknesses, to block the truth if we are at odds with somebody else. This is why John harps on this continually in both his gospel and in his epistle. What is taken away is what the Greek word, the Greek word is koinonia. What's that word mean? Fellowship. Things in common. Koinonia. 
is the reason that we are called to be part of the local church. This is where we can have real koinonia. We are on the same page spiritually. We worship God. We are saved with the blood of Jesus Christ. We are in fellowship with the blood of Jesus Christ and with one another. And that is why the church should be the sweetest place on earth. When you walk the doors into the, into the sanctuary church, it should be like a breath of fresh air. Finally, I'm out of the noise. Finally, I'm in a place where love is on everybody's mind. Where the excitement of hearing from the Word of God has got us all charged up. Where we stand up and, and greet one another formally during the worship service, but it's where I feel most at home. It's a little glimpse of heaven, folks. It won't get any better than it is in the church until we're with the Lord. But koinonia is supposed to be so sweet. It's because we are all of us. It isn't just a testimony. It isn't just because we believe that the Bible says about this or that. It's because, because of our salvation through Christ, the Holy Spirit has put us in Christ. And so when we walk in the darkness, it should not feel right. It should feel awkward. We should know this, in this situation with this person, I've got to address that. This is not right. I'm walking in the darkness right now, and that is so not necessary. and so not pleasing to God. Listen to me. Walking in darkness, if you're walking in darkness, in your Christian life at this moment, you're headed for a fall. Maybe even a terrible, horrible fall that can work great damage in your life. What you need to do right now, if you are walking, not walking in the light, if you can pinpoint what it is that's got you in the dark, Christian, you need to confess that. Give that to the Lord, take this. I, I, I'm, in, I'm in the darkness. I can't explain it. I hate where I am. Things are at odds with this person or this situation. Lord God, take this from me. I repent of it. Walk away from it. If your Christian life at this moment is hidden under some kind of a bushel church, by your language or your discipline with your work or your finances or whatever else may be trying to snuff out the light of Christ in your life, stop, stop. Scrape it off. Don't leave this sanctuary carrying that with you. You shouldn't have dragged it in here if you did. Leave it at the altar. Here, Lord, take this. This is affecting me in ways that are not pleasing to you and are breaking people's hearts in my life. I don't know, one or two of you right now might be so, so far out of fellowship, you can't hear a thing I'm saying. You are so tuned out to what the Word says. You've got this thing going on in your life, and you, you're deep into it. And so this moment, you have to talk about how do I get out of this? How do I get out of this mess I got myself in? The Lord take this right here, right now, in this sanctuary. Paul is talking here about the tools of destruction. They can't unsave you, but they can wreck your testimony. They can wreck more than that. They can wreck your family. They can wreck your friendship, your relationships. They can wreck your job. Paul is saying. The Lord wants to take that load off you. He wants you to leave it at the altar. To walk out of there ready to start a brand new day in your life. All that in the past. I have in my notes here we should reread Ephesians 5, but I think we'll not do that this morning. Let's talk about not darkness, but light. When we walk in the light as Jesus Christ is the light, John contends, we have fellowship. With one another. We have fellowship with the blood of Christ. Where do you have communion? Next Sunday? Yeah, that's our celebration of our fellowship, not just with one another, but our fellowship with the blood of Christ that brought us into the church, that brought us into fellowship with God. That's next Sunday. These two divinely celebrated unions are joyful when we gather at the Lord's table because if we have dumped our issues at the, at the altar, and if we understand that Communion is fellowship with the blood and flesh, yes, of Jesus Christ. We can have true communion in this place. It should be at its very zenith on communion Sundays. How often do you guys celebrate? Every month? Communion? Excellent. What a great refresher every month to remember again what coin
the VA is all about. The lay is wonderful, wonderful. Glad you do that. Verse 9, John is good to remind us that our koinonia with the blood of Christ can fix all of our problems. Can you, you can recite verse 919? If we, go ahead, if we confess our sins, Very good. Here's how I can say that. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For a, a nanosecond in your life when you confess your sins, you are filled with righteousness. Well, you get it mucked up in no time. But you have that moment. And God doesn't care how many times you come before him with all your mess. He forgives you and cleanses you every time. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then John offers this enticing, bizarre thing. He seems to say in chapter 2 that Christians have the ability to not sin. What? Not a chance. Well, on the books, we have that ability. In that moment, we are cleansed from all unrighteousness. The Holy Spirit is by abiding within us. We have the power to not sin. We are weak. We are susceptible to all kinds of prompts. And so, of course, we do sin. So John says, but if you do sin, confess your sins and you'll be cleansed. The encouraging truth in John 2 is this. If anyone does sin, he or she has. It's another word that they have the so they have an advocate. Jesus is our advocate. Now, if you're like, you know, what's an advocate? Tell me. It's a lawyer, y'all. A lawyer, Jesus, as it were, is standing before the throne of God continually making the case for your innocence at the throne of God. When Satan is throwing up all your sins, look at this guy's weak. Look at the weakness so-called Christian has had. Look at the mess he's made here and the mess he's made there and the thing he said that day and the thing he thought that night. Look at all that mess. Jesus is, as it were, telling you, say, no, no, he's been cleansed by my blood. Again, 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 without end. That's what you bought into when you accepted Jesus as your Savior. Your wife may see you as weak as a forgetful, hopeless, temper ruled, inconsistent person. But when Jesus looks at you, when God looks at you, you know what he sees? He sees the sinless perfection of his sin. That's what he sees. You are so clean in God's sight. The job we have on earth, in our sin bodies, is to make that true of us more often in this life than it is not true of us in this life. I should be able to ask your wife after the service, I promise I won't. Tell me, Kathy, is Mike more Christ-like this past week than he was Oh, four or five years ago? And the answer would be, of course, Duke, he's wonderful. Yeah. It might be. No, there should be progressive sanctification. Because all these things are true. We just don't we just don't take advantage of them. We just don't believe them really. So when the times get hard, we just stop believing. We have Jesus is the propitiation makes it possible. You know, in the Old Testament. When you sin, uh, your sins piled up, and on the Day of Atonement, all your sins were forgiven in one day. Remember these stories about it? Your sins were laid on the scapegoat, and the scapegoat is up in the wilderness, and, and for a while, till next year, uh, you're all confessed up. But we can walk in the light by asking God's forgiveness to continue. It is, it is such a wonderful light that God has given us access to us, through the light of and so we should be, be, remember the old song, This Little Light of Mine? Remember that? How many know that song? He's this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Won't let Satan get out. I'm going to let it shine. Won't let Satan get out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Amen and amen. That little song informed my faith as a kid. And it's so very true. We have this light, and Satan's going to always try to make it as dim as possible. But 
we have the power of confession, the power of the Holy Spirit, and God's forgiveness, Christ's cleansing sacrifice to make our lives, our lives shine. This, this place should be a send a beam up to the heavens. We have as many Christians gathered together, all of them filled with God's light. There should be a light coming out of this place. And people make the newspaper call. There was this crazy bright light on the hill, bless the Frederick. Came from First Baptist Church. Those people must be filled with the light of God's love. Amen. Amen. Now these are biblical truths that enable believers and the churches they attend to get back up every time we fall. To brush ourselves by confessing the sins that knocked us back, knocked us down. We can experience God's cleansing, His refreshing and encouraging forgiveness, and then we can get back on the road to glory. Taking the next steps of your sacred journey with a cleansed heart and confession and renewed fellowship with other Christians. That's the promise of the gospel. It's a truth that doesn't just inform us, it can transform us. And that is the bargain we made with God when we accepted Christ as our Savior. You should be so different as a Christian than you were a year ago, five, certainly ten years ago. You should be a different new creature. That's my prayer for us. And people should flock to the Lord. Let us pray that as we allow God to flood this sanctuary with the light of His presence, that the world will find this place curiously attractive. And when it comes to the light that's coming, and it is shining through these good folks at first baptist. Folks, that is my prayer for you. I'm signed on, and this will be your interim while you catch your breath from the struggles you've had the last few years. I'm so pleased to do that, but you have within you the light of God that when it shines forth can change everything. The light reveals everything, including all the best things. That is my prayer for you. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the light that we've been given, not as just a church family, but as believers, as individual followers of Jesus Christ. My prayer for us this morning is that beginning today, your light will shine for us, shine through us in ways that make us curiously attractive, even to our children. What's going on, Bob? What's going on, Bob? In our offices, in our places of business, where we work, where we play. Lord, let your light shine. Let me know, that, Father, that is your reason for giving us your light, that it may shine through us. Father, help us to act, to be what you said we are, light of your glory. May it shine through us, I pray in Jesus' name.